With the motivations behind us, at this point we can now formalize the constituents of the ABC prion model. The model consists of three particles. The A particle has zero electric charge and a neutrinic charge of minus one. The B particle has an electric charge of minus one and a neutrinic charge of minus one. And the C particle has an electric charge of plus two and a neutrinic charge of plus three. The antiparticles have the opposite charges of the particles. Two force carriers have been proposed. The photon, which carries the electromagnetic force, and the neutrino, which carries the neutrinic force. At this point, it is important to say some words about the role that neutrinos play in the ABC prion model. First, I wish to emphasize that the neutrino is treated generically in the ABC prion model. There is no labeling of neutrinos as being an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, or a tau neutrino. Similarly, antineutrinos are not tagged as being different from regular neutrinos in the slides shown here. Like photons, it is assumed that neutrinos can be pair produced in vacuum. In the original publication, it was mentioned that neutrino oscillations should exist at some level. This prediction was based on a pure simplicity argument based on an analogy with photons. It was admitted that it might indeed prove necessary to include a labeling and a separation of various types of neutrino if the data indicated it was necessary, but that would then leave the ABC prion model no better nor worse than the standard model as far as neutrinos are concerned. The argument as to why neutrino oscillations had not been seen to date was that it might be that the cross-section for the interaction was just so small that it hadn't yet been observed. Years after the qualitative prediction for neutrino oscillations was made, neutrino oscillations were indeed found in nature. But note that as viewed from the ABC prion model, these oscillations do not indicate that the neutrino has mass. Rather, they are merely the indication of an event that has a very low cross-section. Photons travel through glass with very small attenuation, even though the photon is the force carrier for the force that binds the atoms together. Similarly, neutrinos can qualitatively travel through large amounts of matter, provided the cross-section for the interaction is small enough. With the extremely tight bindings needed to bind the prions together, it should not be surprising that the cross-sections are small. Since the neutrino has a half-integer spin, it will also have a helicity, and this leads to the conclusion that there will be at least two states of neutrino in nature, and one should identify these separately, perhaps as a neutrino and an antineutrino. But for the purposes of this presentation, that identification is left for another day. And this presentation will continue to use a simple single label for all neutrinos discussed. It will be seen that doing so results in a very convincing model, and the author would welcome collaboration from anyone who may improve the model in the future. As a review before we delve a bit deeper into the ABC prion model, Recall that massive leptons are identified as the various states of an A antiprion bound to a B prion with a single neutrino force carrier. Earlier, we had called this just an A prion and a B prion, but now that we have fully developed both the prions and antiprions in the previous slide, we can recognize that the massive leptons do involve an A antiprion and a B prion while the antileptons involve an A prion and an anti B prion. The up, charm, and top quarks are identified as a bound state of an A prion to a portion of a C prion, while the down, strange, and bottom quarks are identified as a bound state of a B prion with a portion of a C prion. Antiquarks and the massive antileptons are simply the antimatter counterparts of the quarks and massive leptons. The fact that there are three generations of quarks and massive leptons is simply explained by postulating that the lowest mass states are the 1s quantum states of the binding, while the second generation is the, are the 2s states and the third generation are the 3s states. 
At this time, it can be seen that all quarks and massive leptons have now been modeled in such a way that the ABC prion model dovetails nicely into the standard model. Hence, all known hadronic and massive leptonic particles consistent with the standard model are also consistent with the ABC prion model. This is a very important point, since it is well known that the standard model is capable of modeling all known particles. Since the ABC prion model is capable of modeling all quarks and leptons, this shows that the ABC prion model is also capable of modeling all known particles. With a prion model for all known particles now established, the next things to investigate are the many interactions that particles have with one another. A very important class of interactions are the weak interactions. The weak interactions cause quarks to change from one kind to another and also allow for lepton creation. The best known of the weak interactions takes place when a neutron decays into a proton, emitting an electron and a neutrino in the process. Note that while an antineutrino is typically specified, as said earlier, I am using the generic expression neutrino for both neutrinos and antineutrinos in this presentation. The decay of a neutron is shown here in the top portion of the slide, while on the bottom portion of the slide we see the standard explanation for this process. In the standard model, one of the down quarks emits a virtual weak vector boson called the W-. Since the W- has a negative electric charge, this changes the charge state of one of the down quarks from being minus one-third to plus two-thirds, converting that down quark to an up quark in the process. The virtual W particle then decays into an electron and a neutrino. We can see that by converting a down quark to an up quark, the neutron is transformed into a proton during this process. Here we see the process of neutron decay, also known as beta decay, as modeled by the ABC prion model. We start with our model of the neutron, which consists of a C particle, two B particles, and an A particle, as well as their associated neutrinos. The decay process is most easily visualized by taking one of the B particles and having it tunnel out of its binding relationship. Once the B particle has separated from the C particle, a particle-antiparticle pair of A particles, plus a pair of neutrinos, can be formed out of the vacuum. Please note that vacuum formation of particle-antiparticle pairs is very common in physics, so this portion of the decay is not at all unusual. From this intermediate state, the anti-A particle and one of the neutrinos combine with the liberated B particle to form an electron. The remaining A particle takes the place of the original B particle and uses one neutrino in the binding. Lastly, we have one neutrino left over. Hence, the ABC prion model exactly models what happens in beta decay. As once we've replaced the B particle by an A particle, we recognize that we now have a proton in addition to the liberated neutrino and the formed electron. There are some important points to make regarding the process of beta decay that we just saw. First, it is important to note that in the ABC prion model, beta decay is modeled to be analogous to alpha decay from a uranium nucleus. In alpha decay, it is known that the process occurs via quantum tunneling. Alpha particles from within the uranium nucleus are trapped by the nuclear binding forces within the nucleus. However, there is a small portion of the alpha particle's quantum mechanical wave function that extends far enough away from the nucleus so that once the alpha particle materializes at that distant point, the alpha particle can be freed. Since the wave function density is so small at that distant point, the probability for decay is small and therefore the decay of the uranium nucleus takes a long time. 
In the ABC prion model, we see that beta decay is a similar process, although it also involves pair creation from a vacuum. The wave function for the B prion will have a small value at a point far enough away from the C prion that allows formation of a free electron, a free neutrino, and conversion of the neutron to a proton. It will be seen later that the mass of the intermediate state involved in beta decay will sum to about the mass of what is now called the W boson. And hence this process is governed by a propagator that has a mass approximately equal to that of what is now called the W boson. Finally, note that all weak decays can be handled similarly. Since a B prion can tunnel out of any of the down, strange, or bottom quarks, and an A prion can tunnel out of any of the up, charm, or top quarks. Here we see our earlier pictures of the quarks. Recall that a down, strange, or bottom quark has been identified as a binding between a C particle and a B particle. Charged weak decays involve the B particle tunneling through the potential barrier with an A-anti-A pair forming between the B and the C. The anti-A combines with the B to form a massive lepton, and the A combines with the C to change the quark from one type to another. For the up, charm, or top quarks, the A particle will tunnel through the potential barrier, and a B-anti-B pair will form, again leading to the emission of a massive lepton and a change in the type of quark. Each process will involve the emission of a neutrino as well. Hence, in the ABC prion model, the weak decays are identified as radioactive tunneling decays, and there is no weak force. When I was first introduced to the weak force, one of the oddest things was that I was told that the weak force had no direction. But all the other forces have a direction, since gravity is attractive, electric forces are either attractive or repulsive, and the strong force is attractive. We can now see why the weak force was different and that is because it isn't really a force at all. So an additional benefit of the ABC prion model is that in our efforts to simplify the underlying model for elementary particles, we have also simplified the number of forces that exist in nature.